Hello, everyone. Welcome to part two of episode three of Friday with Friends here with Neil. And in part one of this video, he told us exactly how he landed his internships coming from a non-target school at Carleton and landing some top investment banking internships in Canada, as well as New York and the United States. Now we're at part two. And in this section, Neil's going to talk a little bit more about the non-target journey and how that applies to you. First question here, what yeah. are your thoughts on target versus non-target? Like really anything? <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, and it's something I've been thinking about a lot as, as, as time has gone on. Um, I think there is a clear distinction um you know between you know your target schools um you know ivy queens mcgill waterloo ubc um i think i named all of them um but yeah i think i think there's a clear th distinction between them and um i guess the rest of us um that being said um the biggest thing for me is again is it possible right and there is a path forward outside of coming from target school. Um, and because of that, I am okay not being at a target school. Um, had I had to do it over though, and that's the thought that I've had a lot, had I had to do it over, would I have still chosen the harder path? I don't know. Things have worked out pretty well for me. So I'm, I'm okay not changing anything. Um, but if I didn't know, you know, how things would turn out for me, I'm kind of going into a blind, just knowing what I know about Target versus non-Target. I think I would be out of Target, as hard as that is to say, because I really do love Carlton and I, you know, enjoy the community here, built out a good, um, you know, base of friends um, and colleagues and other finance people, finance enthusiasts. But I think there is, there is something to say, like there, there is a significant difference. It would have been great to have even more people um, who are into finance, who are into the industry, who are also, you know, working on uh, whether it's case cracking for consulting or, um, you know, breaking into Wall Street, 400 question guides, um, you know, for getting to get into banking. Um, so there is a distinction. I'm very pleased and very happy with where I'm at thus far. And I don't think I'm leaving anywhere. If I didn't know what was going to happen, and I just knew about the difference. I would choose the path of least resistance, which... I guess would be, um, you know, going to a target school, albeit more expensive, but yeah. Now I have a follow-up question to that. I think yeah. what I've experienced here at McMaster's, yes, there are less students that are interested in finance that kind of understand the recruiting or even, you know, just getting someone to mock interview me. Like I had no connections um, because yeah. no alumni in the prior years have like really gotten to sales and trading at least like the year that just graduated uh so yeah. then sometimes the question that i think about is a double-edged sword like if i did go to ivy yes there may be 20 yes. kids that you know are super keen maybe they're helping me maybe some of them don't want to help me because they want that spot for themselves but do you think that going to a non-target now kind of has its rows where like let's say like rbc for example is trying to fill five spots and they need you know two spots to be from non-targets like could you be that big fish in the pond coming from a non-target or yes. is, it, is it really like easier in the path of least resistance to just go and compete with 20 other of your ivy students yeah no i think that's a very good question and i you know i've thought about that as well myself um you're definitely right in the sense that like if you're coming from a non-target the the respective talent pool that are in, that is into that industry is smaller and from a certain standpoint then that you do have an advantage um from that way and i think that that's definitely one of the pros just like you know there are pros between going to a bulge racket versus an elite boutique um or this firm versus that firm there's some real pros going for to to a non-target as well is you know you have a much more focused um you know recruiting time your, your, your time not everyone is coming to visit your 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 school so the few firms that do or the few firms that you are able to reach out to, you'll be able to be much more diligent, much more focused on that standpoint. And then vice versa, when firms do come, if they do come, or you know, if there's co-op boards, or if they're trying to fill a spot from a particular school or from 
outside of a particular group of schools, you do have the chance to stand out a bit more amongst the, amongst your amongst your peers. And that's a real advantage, and that's something that I've certainly have benefited from um, being here. Um, vice versa, though, and, and you know, like I, I do want to be completely candid as well with with whoever's watching. Is there is still pros from the other side, and you know, one real pro is iron does sharpen iron, right? Like if, if you're around other people who are also interested in this, you know, it does breed competition. Um, but you guys ultimately all get better. Um, that being said, like you can find groups, you know, I'm on the spot student investment fund, other students who are into finance, into career, um, in finance are also here. And I still get that component of iron sharp desire. And we, you know, we push each other, we all learn from one another. Um, and, you know, we can grow our knowledge base, um, our network base, all these things, um, in, 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 in conjunction to one another. Um, but you know, that is, I guess, outside of just your typical target versus non-target it's joining more, um, focused area, which I think regardless of where, where you go, you should do, um, but yeah. I never really thought about it that way. Like, I think coming from non-target, I thought, okay, I could be the big fish in the pond, but then also thinking that competition, we know market forces and economic yeah. competition is exactly. good. So, you know, although maybe 20 kids are going for the same like three investment banking roles. Like you will overall become a lot stronger and you will like push yourself. So maybe this role isn't for you. Maybe you did get beat out, but overall you will be better um, than you were without those, I guess, market forces. Exactly. Which is interesting. I guess, yeah, you're, you're tying it perfectly back into like what we learn in, in school and not in your economics class. Um, but yeah, like r really and truly, I don't know, maybe it's the basketball background or, or you know, the athletics background, but that, air, you know, that air of competition allows you to develop yourself. Um, also gives you like some sort of motivation, like having, you know, you're not just relying on yourself and your own inspiration, but you're also looking around left and right and you see people who, you know, when you're not feeling like studying or, or practicing, you know, these technical questions or case cracking, maybe they are. And maybe that, you know, gives you a little push in the behind that you need to, you know, hit the books for a bit or, you know, if you're not, um, I don't know, if you weren't aware even, um, I think that's a big factor of, um, of of what target schools provide. If you're not aware of what's going on um, in terms of the potential finance careers, you're in a sea of people who like, this is what they do, right? You will, like, you will definitely find out about these, um, these areas, thanks to your colleagues, your classmates, or whatever, and you can kind of learn from that way. That being said, again, if you're coming from a non-target uh, background, you can still reach out to LinkedIn. You can still have those networks. You can still be, um, you know, in the presence of other people who are interested um, in, in these fields. By all means, reach out to me. I'm sure when not, you're the same, you know, these people can reach out to you. Um, and then you can join funds or clubs equivalents at your school, and you'll still get a lot of that those same factors. And then it'll be up to you to do, you know, go the extra mile for some of the other stuff, but. It is definitely, definitely doable um, from a non-target. Um, thankfully, I've done it. When that you've done it, uh, I can think of a handful of other people who have also done it. So, by all means, you know, um, it's not what I was told initially when I got here, which was that like it's you know your odds are null point no 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 one. Um, it's definitely doable. Um, it's just gonna take a little bit more work, and you know, I'm okay with a little bit more work. You learn so much from osmosis going from going into a target school like that cannot be understated like just knowing what the high finance careers are knowing that you know what consulting is how you break down a case when the recruiting timelines are what a good resume looks like like these are things that I think non-targets have to go out and figure out whereas if you go to Ivy it's just in your day-to-day -day, in your conversations would you agree with that I, you know, I definitely would. Um, talking to some of the people I met over the summer um, in my internship from Ivy or Queens, it definitely seems to be, you know, that information just seems to be in the air over there. Um, you know, and, you know, we do have to dig a little bit more. Um, but again, like I think from an employer standpoint, um, I would hope that eventually you get to the point where you see that like, you know, us kids from non-targets, if we're in here, there's a certain level of hunger that we have. Like we are really interested. It's not just, you know, this is the job because everyone's getting this job um, that everybody else on campus is going. Like the people from non-targets who are working 
in banking and consulting and all of these, you know, uh, high, we'll call it higher prestige areas. They're hungry. They want it. They mm -hmm. have to go out and, you know, and search for the information, you know, go out and, you know, hunt for, you know, any little bit of, you know, scraps that they could find, right? And not to say that people from target schools don't have to, I'm sure they do. And they have their own set of unique challenges that maybe we can't identify and relate to. Um, but from our standpoint, the hardest thing that I found has been finding the information, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you don't know what you don't know, how do you, how do you proceed, right? And so um, every little bit that I have been able to figure out was thanks to, you know, a um, few, you know, choice people that I've met and then my own research as well. And I guess you do have a chance of a few more choice encounters uh, when you go to one of those target schools. So I think there's got to be some some way of valuing the people from our target school for the work that they put in in order to, you know, even just be aware of what's going on. Like I, one thing that's like pretty like, I think understated is these recruiting timelines are so far in advance, like so far in advance. So if you're mm -hmm. coming from an target and you didn't even know about banking beforehand, you find out about it. You got to already have like by your freshman summer, you got to have some sort of internship, some sort of experience so that you can get something in your actual field by your second year. So you can recruit for your third year one, which starts in your second year. It's kind of crazy to think about, which means that your first year summer is really the first one that matters. And you got to find something real quick. Mm -hmm. right? And if you're not at one of these schools, how would you know? You know what I mean? Like most people in first year are content with like any job that pays for tuition. Like, you know, take a little pressure off mom and dad or, you know, my friends are doing this. So maybe I'll work there. Or, you know, so a lot of people are doing summer camps or whatever. And these are not bad jobs. These are the typical jobs that, you know, you know, first year university students and, and high school students get. But if you want these jobs, you got to do something else. And heck, how do you even know that that's what you're, that what's expected of you? Because that's not what's expected of the average, you know, university student. Right. So. Things like that, like things, things like that really, I think, make, you know, make obviously the degree of competition in these roles stand out, um, but makes it that when you do have that information, coming from a non-target background, you have to go out and hunt and search for it. And I think that that should be valued um, almost as much as, you know, having it already and, you know, learning about it. Um, yeah. So that I think that's, that's something that's severely undervalued. And I, and I think it would help a lot of us. Uh, non-targets out if, if it was valued uh, a bit more but I guess maybe it's just you know you got to have it to have it that's such a great point the recruiting timelines are so crazy and so far in advance that information is power it's money when it comes to those sorts of roles and not that you can't figure it out but going to a target kind of guarantees that by osmosis you will know and you will know like in a timely manner so that you can grab them when you need them but exactly. target or non-target it's it's a little bit more difficult you got to be scrappy you got to be hunting for the scraps you, you know someone someone said exactly. this okay let me take that someone said that oh i went to an hour yeah. event. Like i went out to toronto and i talked to one investment banker and they talked to me for two minutes like i'm gonna grab that you know it's very exactly. different <laughs> exactly and then other things like um having the guides like that would have saved me so much time and money. In fact, if I had the guys or, you know, a senior member had the guys and gave it to us or, you know, things like that. Um, and even when I eventually did get some from other people, you know, I had already bought in a couple or I had already, you know, spent time searching for this or whatever it might be. Whereas talking to some of my colleagues um, from, you know, those target schools um, this summer, they're like, oh yeah, like the minute I, you know, accepted my offer at ivy or accepted my offer at you know queens or whatever and i knew i was going in there these guys were made available i could reach out to anyone and those guys are there so obviously you know these guys are basically the cheat code for you know just about any investment banking interview um you don't necessarily know which question is going to be asked but you know it's going to be one of these 400 mm -hmm. and some students have gone as far as to tell me is that they've broken out which firm asks which questions which is crazy to me you know what I mean? Like, how how do you not, you know, and I'm, again, and not to discredit anyone who's at those schools, I'm sure they have their own set of challenges. But in my mind, as you know, someone who doesn't have those, I'm like, how do you not get the job if you know exactly what questions and what firm is going to ask? You know, if I know that, you know, RBC is going to ask question one through five of this section, and you know, three through 10 of that question, I can prep specifically for that. 
I don't know what they're going to ask. I've been keeping track of every single question I've ever been asking in the best making interviews, trying to find some semblance of like a, a trend or a common thread or whatever, but I still can't figure it out because I'm only one person going through interviews. Yeah. Right. But yeah. That, that is so true. Like the knowledge sharing and given some people are going to gatekeep at those schools, of course, because it's, you know, it's human nature, but like, you know, if you're in touch with the year above you and all of them have recruited for the big five and bulge brackets, they're going to have that bank of questions that you can go to. And I remember when I was recruiting for my very first sales and training internship, I had no idea what a guide was. Like I had my interview in two days. I didn't know anything. So I reached out to this girl at Goldman on LinkedIn who I chatted with before and I asked her for a guide and she sent me like thankfully, you know, it helped and it worked, but she sent me this huge like city bank deck that was like, like 50 pages long for sales and trading. And that's, that's, I later realized it wasn't all very relevant. Whereas there are some more Canadian specific guides that are a lot shorter and more condensed. That if I went through that, I feel like I could have knocked it out of the park even more. So yeah, yeah like the guides are, are such a big thing, especially, you know, having that Canadian contact as well, or someone from your school I, that you've experienced done the courses that you've done. It, it is everything. It literally changes the game. Like, I think back to like when I got told that, you know, you're no longer being considered for MA, but you are being considered for DCN. Your interview is tomorrow, 9 a.m. I knew nothing about DCM. I just knew what they did in very, very surface level. Like my understanding was they help companies make bonds. That's <laughs> all I knew. Right. And I have, you know, 12 hours, you know, 16 hours or so to figure out as much as I can to be ready for an interview. And obviously there's Google and I, and I did Google and I YouTube some stuff. YouTube University has, you know, been my saving grace for, for most of my undergrad. Um, but it would have been so much easier if I could just open guide the guide and go to the DCM section. These are the type of questions they ask. This is what you should be ready for. It would have saved me. I, I went in knowing nothing, mm -hmm. right? I did all I could to learn as much as I can about the overall business, how that, you know, how that desk makes money. What do they do? Who are their clients? Um, but that stuff is like on the first page of the, of the guide in the mm -hmm. DCM section. It's on the first freaking page. And I don't even, you know, I'm searching through stuff. I got to figure out, is this even, you know, legit? Is this a credible source? I don't know. You know what yeah. I mean? So like these, these sort of things would have, would have changed, changed the game. And I keep thinking back to like, had I not gotten the, 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 the DCM thing at RBC, where would I be now? Cause that's one less internship on my book. Is Lazar still interested? Yes, no, maybe so. I don't know, right? Um, you know, which means my third year summer is, is looking a little different, which yeah. means ultimately potential career is looking drastically different. Yeah. Right? So these kind of change the way, you know, the lay of the land, so to speak. Um, so yeah, guides, target schools, they do make a significant difference. Not impossible without, but, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a more challenging road and you know in the end you, we all get to the same spot but uh you know it would be it would be nice to get there a little bit faster a little easier mm -hmm. uh, for sure and i think also like if you went to ivy on top of the guides like you saw like okay you suddenly have a dcm interview like i'm sure you can search up someone and someone that is currently at ivy business school either in your year or the year above you has done an internship on dcm and just like a 30-minute conversation on the phone and and like they understand, you know, the way that finance recruitment can just switch like that and how time sensitive it is. And I think they'd be willing to get on the phone with you to talk to you for 20, 30 minutes about their experience, even if you message them like, you know, the night of. Literally, even to this day, I still struggle to, um, you know, get a few messages back when I send, when I send messages, send emails. Um, so it's a struggle that we all deal with and it would be so much easier because the return, the return rate is so much fat higher when you're reaching out to somebody that like went to your same school or worked at your same company or whatever it might be, right? It's so much easier when you have that point of con uh, in common with someone, that point of contact with someone. And the fact is, most of these bankers are from these, you know, select few schools. When you, when I'm sure, when they reach out, they've got a higher success rate in terms of getting a reply um, than you and I do. Um, and again, like. It, again, it would make a, a huge difference, um, I think, anyways, um, had I had that. And you kind of just have to, you know, roll with the punches. 
because like, you know, like you said, the night before, if I could have reached out to someone from Carlton that's working in DCM, someone from Carlton that's working in any investment banking role for that matter, they probably would have been able to better tell me what, um, you know, DCM is, but there's only a handful. Is that, is that particular person available on a drop time? Maybe, maybe not. Is that next person available? Um, right there, because if we have fewer people, there's a high, there's a higher likelihood of someone not being available versus if, you know, I don't know what the percentage of people from Ivy that go into banking. Um, but I do know the percentage of bank bankers from Ivy is, is very, very high. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a higher likelihood of someone from that, from, 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 from that cohort, from that alum, uh, from that school to be available at that moment's notice or even a planned meeting, whatever it might be provide guidance and then people are more likely to provide that guidance to people from their own school and that's just i guess that's human nature where, where, where we have a herd mentality and people from you know our same tribe or same herb or, you know we're always more uh willing to help them out more more so than somebody else so i guess it just kind of is what it is um but yeah again like there are some very nice people outside of you know that are from those target schools that are working in the industry that'll still take your call still take your message mm -hmm. And you don't want to discredit those because they, they are out there. Um, reach out to them, reach out to whoever you can, and you'll see a few people will still be willing and still be receptive. Um, but uh, you know, let's 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 be honest and say that that's not the the overwhelming majority either. Yes. Um, but when you do meet them, you know, be very, very thankful. Um, be honest and 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 you know, use them to to help you guide you as, as a mentors, right? Um, but yeah. yeah, going off track. This isn't in my question book, but I'd love if you could talk a bit about like equity, diversity, inclusion in terms of recruiting. I think one thing I've struggled with is that the two target schools, Queens and Ivy, are almost triple the tuition of non-target schools, and so like my biggest, I guess, fear or concern is that okay these are the two schools that are piping into these high prestige careers, but are they taking students from a specific bracket that is already, you know, higher up in society? Maybe their parents are bankers. Maybe, you know, like, is it, is it just a feedback loop? How, how easy, how difficult is it for someone from non-target also maybe subsequently from a certain like lower income bracket to break in? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, part of that, I feel like I would have to, I would have to ask the admissions office of those target schools to see, like, are they, do they have some sort of, you know, DEI strategies to include, um, so that people of more diverse backgrounds get into their student body to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, and then maybe from there, that kind of trickles over into these big banks. Um, I, I'm not sure from, from that standpoint, um, I, I certainly have a guess, but um i'm I'm not 100 percent sure what i do know is these banks do have dei initiatives um and you know they have you know some value and they do help uh enter um i guess maybe i can take uh, a side note um a little bit at the start like i applied for a dei uh incentivized role at rbc when i, when I first got there and for for a while i looked at the job posting and I almost didn't want to apply and being completely honest I didn't want to apply because I didn't want people to you know discredit my accomplishment because like oh you got it because it's a DI role or you got it because it's this or really yeah you might have been the best but within this small group as opposed to best overall and I had to kind of take my mindset out of it because these roles are meant to highlight people um, who come from backgrounds that are underrepresented underprivileged whatever it might be and show that they would have gotten the role regardless of where they apply. They just weren't getting it because of X or Y reason in the past, right? It's not because the bank has some sort of quota that we need to fill. Let's get more people of this background. Let's get anyone that's qualified, but let's also get more people of this background. So we do need more, but these people would have been in regardless. They have the qualify, they, you know, they, they qualify, they have the qualities, the skill set necessary. We just were overlooking them for whatever reason in the past. And, you know, let's not, we won't necessarily get into what those reasons were in the past before, all very well documented, um, not for me to speak on. But my point being is these people were qualified um, and would have gotten the role otherwise. They just weren't before. 
let's mm-hmm. find a way to highlight them so we we know exactly where they are. We can hire directly from that. And I had to get myself out of the mindset I had before, which is if I apply here and I get the role here, you know, either myself or other people will discredit my accomplishment based off of this. And I think that's not exactly legit. That's not exactly um, accurate. Um, and so once I made that switch, I felt more um, asked and able to apply for those roles. I think that maybe from the, um, you know, the company side, there should be something. Um, I don't know that, you know, they need to state something, whatever it is. But I think if I was thinking that, and I know a few of my friends and colleagues were also thinking that, I think there might be a good amount of people um, of our communities who are also thinking that, in which case they're losing out on many more applicants, which means there's even fewer of us getting into these industries um, than there should be. And there's already so few of us to begin with, right? So that's something worth thinking about, worth noting. Um, but to your original question, um, which was um, like the DEI initiatives in general, um, I think, um, and you've experienced this, there are, there are very, very few um, people of color within any of these industries. I think they're, they're making strides towards having more. Um, I think things have gone progressively better, a lot better even. We're still not where we need to be, and I think there's still work to be done. And I think that they know this as well, and they are striving towards it. And you know, hopefully, one day we do we do get to the point where um, we do reach out. But I think the goal is for it to resemble um, the overall population as well as much as possible, right? If that be, is the case, then I believe the sum of all people of color should be at least parity to the sum of mm-hmm. um, the overall majority of the country. Um, but yeah. Hmm. I love that. And yes, it's not like, I think some people, and I don't want to put a label on them, but they get upset when there are diversity initiatives that, you know, include people from a very specific background. And, and they're thinking that, I don't know, for example, the training floor is going to be overrun with a specific population. But really, that's, that's not the case. If you take a look at any trading floor or any like, investment banking floor, like you really realize that what's inside does not reflect what is outside. And so having these diversity programs is not like, like, don't worry, everyone. It's not like people are going to come and, you know, completely like change up the landscape. It's really so that they can add the few here or there that make it, make it so it is. Yeah. In tandem. If we, if we look at like, a city like Toronto, right, which is supposed to be the most multicultural, um, I think, city in the world uh, by, by this point. Why would it not stand to reason that your trade floor or your investment banking floor resembles um, the population, you know, demographic breakdown um, of a city like Toronto? If we're this, if this is a trade floor in Toronto, and assuming most of the people that are getting hired are from the Toronto adjacent area it should have some sort of correlation in terms of, you know, the demographic makeup should look fairly similar. Mm -hmm. Um, Same with New York, same with, you know, whatever city these investment banks are at, it should somewhat resemble either uh, on a micro scale the demographics of that particular city or overall country. Yeah. Right. And it just doesn't right now. It just doesn't. Um, So I think their goal is to eventually get there and, you know, to give them credit, like they have been doing significant work. Um, and they're pushing, you know, pushing those boundaries as much as they can, and they're continuing to do so. Let's be frank as well and say that, you know, there's still some, there's still a little bit of ways to go. Um, but I am glad to see, you know, thanks to the work of people from our demographics um, and, and, and communities and cultures from the past, um, as well as some allies, that, you know, progress has been made. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm glad to, to be around today as opposed to 20 years from now. Yeah. Um, and hopefully future generations will be able to say the same, that they're, you know, better off being around then than they were in our time. Quick question here. What are your thoughts on the term diversity hire? I myself have received it. I won a diversity scholarship at RBC and, and I, even people from my cohort, they didn't want to tell anyone that they were part of diversity. Like we might've had meetings, diversity specific meetings, and they would be very secretive as to where they were going because they felt like it was almost almost like a badge of shame, you know? So I've always been super vocal about it because I know that I could have made it either way. But what about you? 
Yeah, no, that's like that. That's I guess that's what I was alluding to um, earlier when I said that initially I didn't want to apply because I didn't want that stigma or that 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 badge of diversity hire. Um, because a lot of people think that way. You know, I've seen it, you know, around me and some, you know, on campus and school. Even when I did, um, you know, I, I won't mention any names, but I remember when I did post about receiving the scholarship at RBC and, and getting the role, someone felt the need to make a comment saying you got it because you're a diversity hire. Um, I don't know if that comment's still there, actually. I, mean, I should probably look. Um, but that says more about that person than it says about me. Um, and my, my point being is, you know, I'm sure you were not, I, I felt the same way, so you're definitely not the only one, but I'm sure even outside of us two, there's many other people who felt that way. I also got the scholarship at RBC, and though I wouldn't say our meetings were secretive, um, I definitely wasn't broadcasting it out, right? I definitely, you know, I had a meeting, if you asked me, sure, I would tell you, but I probably wouldn't volunteer that information. Um, and I think like that's what I meant by maybe from the the firm standpoint, there's a bit more that needs to be done to um, release that stigma, whether it be making it clear that these are not people that are getting hired because they're less than, but we just need more people of color. These are people that are getting hired that are just as qualified or you know potentially being discredited in the past because of their their skin, the the, the color of their skin, or because of you know, the makeup of their last name or because of X, Y, or, you know, X or Y reason. I think once you, once they do that, there will be less of a stigma, um, less of a, of a shame for the people who are uh, getting hired as diversity, um, you know, students or full-timers. Um, but I think, so I think internally there needs to be a, shame, uh, a change and also within the people who are applying for these roles, there needs to be a change in how we value it. Um, how we, you know, how we think of ourselves when we apply to these roles, how we think of our accomplishments. And once both happens and, you know, one may need to happen before the other. Um, and I think that would be, uh, you know, up to everyone's personal philosophy. Um, but yeah, uh, so a change yeah. definitely does need to occur. Do you think it would be easier if you went to a target and if you were advising a grade 12 student, very similar to you, they're very yeah. ambitious, they have an offer from a non-target and from IV, how would you advise them? Oh, man, okay, you're putting me on the spot. Um, okay, quickly, well, do I think it would have been easier? Yes or no? Yes. Why? For all the reasons we said, Sharp, iron sharpens iron. You're in, you know, a sea of people who are also just as passionate, just as ambitious, just as driven um, about this particular industry, learning through osmosis, um, learning, you know, amongst your kin, amongst your, com your you know, your, your, your colleagues and comrades, whatever you want to call them. Um, there is a higher likelihood of you developing the skills necessary. Um, it might make it a little bit more challenging on a um, position by position base, but as an aggregate, I think there is a higher likelihood of you getting a job in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, now, if I was advising a 12th grader who had an offer from IV and an offer from Carlton um, or another non-target school, um, what would I advise them to do? I think... There is some sort of circumstances that change things. For example, you know, I I'm I grew up in Ottawa. Going to Carleton allows me to one have a significantly cheaper tuition. That's that can be overstated enough. Um, still, there's that. I don't have to you know you know pay residence. I can live at home. Makes my overall university uh, time a lot cheaper. Um, I probably value that a bit more than some other people would um you know I, I would like to get out of school without any um you know osap money laying over my head uh, hanging over my head rather and that kind of adds uh, a certain element of to uh, a certain certain component to, to my decision um so if that's not a factor for you then maybe that changes things a little bit also like if you are unsure um that also changes things a little bit because I think Carlton will give you a much friendlier environment to figure these things out. Um, it might not give you the, the spark plug that you needed right off of the bat, if that's what you're interested in, but certainly there's a, a place and an avenue for you um, to, to, to do that, to get that. I mean, I clearly got it. The minute I got in here, I knew what I wanted and I was going to go out and try to get it. And I was able to, to join this process of investment fund and learn everything that I could. Um, to 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 make it so i myself would still go through the same path and if you are an ottawa kid 
you want to you want to stay close to home you want to you know save on rent or whatever it might be you still are interested in high finance i still think it is very possible uh from carlton so i would advise to go to carlton if you are maybe from the surrounding area already you want to go to the biggest name school you want to go to the you know you give yourself the highest likelihood or the highest chance i think ivy probably gives you what you want um so i guess it depends who you are who you are in that archetype mm -hmm. um you know i tend to be you know i've always been an underdog i tend to root for the underdog um so you know i'm rolling with uh with the ravens uh for sure and you touched on this bit briefly the friendly environment at carlton i've also felt a friendly environment here at mcmaster because like I was the only one recruiting for specific roles. I, you know, even when I, when I got them, I was the go-to person to talk to. And I think it was a very friendly environment for me to thrive. Would I have applied to these high finance roles as a second year, knowing that it's very hard to get and knowing that these kids whose parents are bankers are going for the exact same roles. Would I have done that? I'm not sure. So could you talk a little bit about the environment, maybe a, bit about like Carlton and, and the environment, maybe how welcoming, welcoming it has been for you. And obviously we don't go to the target schools, but from what I hear it, it is very competitive um, for better or for worse. Yeah, I think that Carlton has given me the chance to appreciate both, appreciate the, um, the homey, uh, friendly environment and learning through discussions and um, not everything is a fight or a competition. But at times, it has also given me, you know, the competition outside that I think you do need a little bit to um, shake out, you know, the procrastination, the rust, or, you know, you know, sometimes your students were lazy. Um, and so mm -hmm. it's given me the chance to shake those off. And then when, you know, competitions, you know, you can only compete for so long um, and for, for so often. Sometimes, you, you, you know, you need a little break and it's giving me both. Um, and so... That's something that I have valued, um, you know, to be able to have the chance to give back to younger students now that I'm, I guess, an upperclassman, uh, so to speak. Um, I can teach what I know and I'm not, I guess maybe I should start with like what I've heard from some of my friends at these target schools is um, though everyone is, though the information is out there, there is a whole lot of the gatekeeping of said information. Um and I don't, I don't find that here. People come in, uh, whether it's through the fund or through other ventures, whatever it might be, and people are just sharing information freely because it's not a zero-sum game. People aren't thinking, if you get this, there's one less shot for me. That's not what people's thought process is. Um, and I think that, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats, as they say. People, you know, epitomize that growth in terms of, especially on the fund, especially in business. Um, I can't really talk as much for other faculty, but I would imagine it's uh, pretty similar. Whereas from what I hear um, in other in other schools, um, you know, people tend to hold things close to their chest, maybe, you know, share a few things with a few friend, close close friends. And there is a, a wider breadth of knowledge and out there, um, there are a few more doors uh, in order to access that information. Um, I guess maybe we should touch on the fact that like, I guess it can sound a little oxymoronic to say that, but also say that they have um, more, more, um, you know, access to information. I guess the way I, you know, internalize it is that um, there's just a few more doors, but there is a vast, vast more information out there for them to have. I think that's what makes a distinction. Um, but you join their funds, you join their clubs, and all of a sudden, door after door after door opens. Um, and gives you access to, you know, a richer library of content and information. Um, so I guess that's how you um, get rid of that, you know, uh, almost contrast, uh, contrasting uh, ideas. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a great analogy. I guess, like, going to Ivy, maybe you have access to, let's say, 100 small libraries, because not everyone is willing to tell you everything. But if you go to Carlton or Master, maybe you have access to three large libraries, three people exactly. that are willing to tell you absolutely everything. And so, you know, no, some people may do better in one scenario over another. It's not a win or loss, but these are, these are the facts. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And these things come back to like very be very very useful in, you know, in all aspects. 
one thing that comes to mind uh, very quickly is like salary negotiation um, and that transparency. And I think one thing that people don't really necessarily realize is that if you accept a, a, a lower salary at the very beginning, you are playing catch up the rest of your career mm -hmm. because your next promotion is going to be based off of a percentage increase from your past role. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you don't know what to expect, like, um, you know, you don't know what a banker makes. You don't know what a consultant makes. You don't know what this makes. And you can search outside. And certainly there's a ton, for, especially for banking. Like there's, there's a ton of resources out there um, through YouTube. It's very well documented. Um, but I don't know about you, but when I first saw the numbers, I was like, this can't be real. Yeah. Right. Like, I don't know <laughs> if this source is, is legit, you know, like someone needs to fact check this. Um, but having people who have gone through this to, to validate what you're seeing, and let you know that you know you're not seeing double, or you know, no, this is this is what you should ask for, or you got this offer, you're getting a lot less than what you should. You should ask for more, or you know what? They're maybe they're not valuing you. Maybe look elsewhere. Right? These are things that make a significant difference, and they compound as the years go on. Right? Because mm -hmm. if you're now taking a you know ten percent haircut um, in your first year, and you get a promotion two years later, that is going to give you a ten percent increase. From where you're at well you just now finally caught up to where you should have been yeah but your colleagues who have you know gotten the real number from the very beginning are now 20 percent ahead of you whatever that number uh, you know breaks out to you and that only continues as you go from associate to vp to vp to director director to md and so on and so forth what do you want ambitious non-target canadian students to know really anything it could be about recruitment or school like school life yeah a few things come to mind. First of all, you are totally right. It sucks. It's hard. Um, you know, I think I used to, you know, I, I tend to have at times like a, you know, lift yourself up by your bootstraps attitude. But I think it would have been great to, um, you know, have someone validate the fact that, yeah, it is, I, I am, you know, running into a few more roadblocks than I would have imagined. Um, so, yeah, you are going to run into some roadblocks. It is going to be somewhat harder kind of is what it is um but you can go out and continue and eventually you're going to stumble into these people who are very uh, open they recognize the advantages that they had and they're going to be able to and willing to give back um and event like it's a matter of time you're eventually going to hit those people and those people are going to save you a lot of time they are going to be great mentors keep them around um you know love and appreciate them um for all that they you know they, they, they provide and they help you with um, so that's the first thing that comes to mind. The second thing is, you know, I guess the, the other side to that coin, it is going to be harder. So you're going to have to work harder. And that kind of just is what it is. Um, and, you know, what you can do is you can go the extra mile. Um, again, last, last time we talked, I talked about like some of those open house, uh, I guess, open homes that I used to go to. Um, those virtual open uh, homes where, you know, companies would talk about, you know, their different roles. And oftentimes they're the same one from one virtual location to another. Show up to both, show up to all three, ask questions at all three, have your camera on at all three. And all of a sudden you, again, you're presenting yourself to someone who is hungrier, who wants it, who is, you know, willing, or, you know, maybe you only got to ask two questions on the first one. Um, show up to the next one and ask your next questions. They're going to be like, oh, this kid still had more questions. He, you know, he really wants these answers. Um, you're going to have to network more. You don't have as robust of an alumni network. That's fine. Build one, right? These universities had to start out and build out their network, right? So you're just going to have to do the same. You're starting from scratch. Yeah, it's tough. It's unfortunate. Um, but it kind of is what it is, right? The, you know, you play with the hands that you're dealt with, right? You play with your cards. Um, you will reach out to whoever you can, build a network, build a database, keep in touch, uh, track everything and things will progress smoothly uh, from that accord so that's number two number three is just enjoy the ride honestly enjoy the ride these four years go by in a blink of an eye uh, i'm not done yet but i'm at year three and um you know things have gone by really really fast um sometimes for the better sometimes for the worst um but i think i would be um even happier today if I had enjoyed enjoy the journey a little bit. Every technical question that I stumbled on interview and I was so mad at myself about for not getting, um, 
I guess it's easier to say in hindsight now, but um, you know, I would have enjoyed that better because that's when you're truly learning. That's when you're truly posing questions. And even at your interview, like by no means was I the, you know, the number one most amazing intern. I really wasn't, but enjoy the ride, learn all that you can ask questions. That's one thing that I kind of was, um, you know, a little bit too shy to, to ask all the questions that I had been, that I, um, you know, wish I could have. Um, so do that, whatever you can. And then whatever relationships you do foster, whether it be at your internship or through networking, keep them up, like keep them up, reach out to them, reach back out, message them, keep in touch. Cause Bay street, wall street, whatever the street is in San Francisco, that all the banks are at, whatever the street is in Chicago, it's a pretty small street. Um, lots of bankers, but we all, they all kind of circle around. Um, so you'll see them again. So make sure you put your best foot forward. You know, it takes a lot to build a reputation. It takes very little to destroy one. So do whatever you can to upkeep it and keep in touch with the people that you meet and, you know, be your true, genuine self. And uh, yeah, I think in the long run, it'll, it'll pay dividends. Awesome. Well, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you okay. so much for joining us on episode three. I hope you are all enjoying this series so far and stay tuned for next week where I have Tyler on and he will talk about his many internships in product management. I will definitely be tuning into that. I'm looking forward to it.